Thank you. So hi, uh, and first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, thank you to the wonderful Wharton team for putting this conference together. Of course, thank you to my friend and collaborator, Heather Whiteman, who did most of the work. Uh, so my name is Alex, and the story starts in 2014. Uh, back then, I was a co-founder of a clinical genetics company called Invite, and as a business, we were crushing it. Our technology was working, sales were happening, we were talking to investment bankers planning out our IPO, while internally it was getting uglier. We, we had hired a bunch of people, and decisions weren't getting made, and politics were emerging. There was factions of people vying for power and for control of the future, and I was scared. Now, my background's in software, but I found myself doing a lot of the facilitating uh, the company out of this mess, and next thing I know, next thing I know, I am now the chief people officer of a publicly traded biotech company. And I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, but I do know one thing. I'm crystal clear on what I don't want to do, which is base people decisions on anecdotes in a way that I've seen over and over again in my career. Uh, so I look for tech. And, and annoyingly, I found that the tools out there, they look at companies kind of the way accountants do. So it's all about silos and cost centers and profit centers and business units. And, and literally none of the things I care about work that way. Right? Influence, decision making, innovation, attrition even. All of these things spread through networks. People are social, but the tools aren't looking at these networks. 50-ish uh, years ago, Stephen Kerr wrote like what, probably my favorite paper ever on the folly of rewarding A while hoping for B. And since then, not a whole lot has changed. In these traditional incentive structures, people are forced to like, engage in and try to win these like, depressing little zero-sum games with their very own colleagues for recognition and for credit and for promotions. And, and while we, we talk about valuing collaboration, or almost all of us talk about valuing collaboration, we're actually incentivizing the opposite of collaboration. So I asked a team of engineers to go build me a view of a company as a graph. And they did. Uh, and when I saw it, I didn't believe it. Like, I, I literally asked them to go find a bug in the code. And when a few days later they came back to me and there wasn't a bug in the code, I, I actually I kind of knew that there's a, there's a problem. I have a problem on my hands. And, because when I saw who was interconnected with whom, I saw that there's a whole class of quietly awesome people who are doing really, really important things, and I don't know their names, right? Uh, and, and it won't surprise anybody here, I don't think, but most of these stealth top performers, most of these stealth leaders, they didn't look like me, right? Just saying. So when we then layered like a 360 degree assessment on top of this graph, it confirmed what we knew, right? That, that we were systematically underperforming, uh, sorry, under-recognizing, under-promoting, underpaying the people who weren't actively self-promoting. Like we had built an incentive structure where the squeakiest wheels were getting all the grease. And, and this was both unfair, but also very, very counterproductive. And what we also knew right away is that we, we have, not only do we have a problem, but we also have the beginnings of a tool in our hands to fix this problem. And we immediately knew that this was important. And with that, I'll hand the mic over to, to Heather. Yeah. So this is about where I come into the story. So I am a former people analytics practitioner turned professor, and I was running around trying to see hey, while I've been busy over here, what's going on in the world of people analytics? And a former colleague reaches out and says, Heather, you have to see what Alex is doing. You're going to love it. And so I meet Alex. I meet the org graph and what was known as the org one tool. And let's just say my friend was right. Uh, it was a 360-year performance-based feedback tool, but not like any I had ever seen before. Uh, firstly, it didn't use the traditional approaches to identifying reviewers. It used network data and collaboration metrics to identify the people who you work most closely with, which is good, because it's the people you work with who probably can provide, can provide you the best feedback about how you're doing. 
And it was also unique in its approach to rating systems. So when you were re uh, reviewing peers, you had the opportunity to place them on a grid with two axes, teamwork and skills. With the idea then that each individual is placed on this grid in a relative distance to other individuals. This then forms the basis of what was known as the performance rank score, or sorry, peer rank score, or PRS for short. It's way easier to just say PRS. So the PRS score was based off of placement, but not just generic averages or sums of placement. It used an iterative algorithm that would consider all possible pairwise comparisons across different peers that were rated. And it added in extra um, incremental changes based on certain factors such as how spread apart reviewer scores tended to be, how differentiating they are as a reviewer, uh, the reputation and even the PRS score of the reviewer themselves, as well as how expected or unexpected a, a ranking might be in the system. And all of these played together to create this PRS score. So I thought this was a really unique, really interesting approach, but does it actually measure performance? So the team decided to do a couple of studies. They had about 250 employees in each study, and they looked at pre-existing performance management processes to see where there was alignment. In one study, they found that individuals who had been rated by their peers for something known as a spot review, which is basically a peer-nominated bonus type approach, did in fact have significantly higher PRS scores than those who were not and that there was a positive correlation with how many times you were nominated for this and your PRS score. So nice alignment with peer reviews. Um, also looked into some compensation factors, seeing that even though it wasn't highly correlated with salary, it was very highly correlated with the percent of shares or grant-based distributions given to an individual. And this was a nice way to show that yes, there was some validity between pre-existing performance measures and the PRS which is cool, great, neat approach. Hey, it maybe is valid, yay, but does it matter? Like, can your organization do anything with it? Are there any potential outcomes? The uh, short answer to that is yes. The long answer is the clock is ticking down way too fast for me to tell you all of them. So you can read the entire uh, case study white paper if you like, but needless to say, the organization was able to identify influencers, find employee issues, bottlenecks, work on team dynamics, and even do things like identify patterns of bias and then change how they do HR processes to address them. My favorite example of which is after about three years in place, more women were in leadership positions at Invitae than ever before. So all these great things, wow, cool approach, might actually be valid. Holy cow, the organization has outcomes. I'm like, Alex, please let me write about this, please. Uh, and that's where we decided to work on creating the white paper that was submitted to this uh, conference. But when we sat down to write it, it was no longer about the approach or even the outcomes. It started to become an interesting conversation because this tool was still just an in-house tool and a lot of its growth had been hindered by the company. And Alex kept getting calls from former employees going, hey, I, I don't know how to run at this new business without this tool, can we have it? And so the question that Alex was facing and where we actually end up leaving this case study, if you were to read the document, it ends only on the question of, was it time for this to stop being just an in-house tool and be something that should be provided to more organizations? And if you're a student in one of my classes, that's literally where it ends. And I'm like, what do you think? What should we do? Um, luckily, you are here, and you have Alex here. So Alex, was it time? What happened? Well, I mean, it'll surprise exactly no one that the, the answer we came up with was an, an, an unequivocal yes. So we spun out the technology and the team out of the previous company into its own startup, Performica. I am here now representing it as, as co-founder and CEO. But the real answer to that question is, look, we'll get it in a few years. Right? Like, I, th I think we should have done it, but, but maybe in a couple more of these conferences, we'll, we'll find out. 
if I was right. So well, Alex and I gave you the story from 2014 to now. We'll let you know how it goes in a few years, maybe with a, a section B of the case study. If you're curious to read more, you can check out the full paper. Alex and I would be happy to talk more. It's kind of the end of this story, but the beginning of the Performica one, and we'll see where it lands itself. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thank you so much.